But growth, growth is what we're going to talk about today. Healthy spiritual growth. And I'm not even going to uh, beat around the bush, as it were. I'm going to tell you right off the bat. For healthy spiritual growth, we want to look at praying, reading, and fellowship. Keep praying, keep reading, and keep showing up. Let's turn on our Bibles, and if you brought your Bible with you, we're going to look at Matthew chapter 6. If you'd like to use a church-provided Bible, it looks like this. It should be right in front of you. And we're going to look at page on our church Bibles of 961. The Bible is made up of 66 books. The last 27 books are what we know as the New Testament. Matthew is the very first book in the New Testament. It would be one of the four Gospels. And on page 966, we read from Matthew chapter 6. Verses 28 through 30. And why do you worry about your clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And while your Bibles are in your hand, we're going to move over to uh, the third gospel in the first four, in the book of Luke. And that's going to be found on page 1031. And from Luke, we're going to read uh, chapters 12 and verse 27 through 28. In the words of Luke. Consider how the lilies grow. Consider how the lilies grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. I've been thinking a lot about spiritual growth recently. So when Dan asked me to speak, my first thought was wonderful. Now we can really dig a little deeper into spiritual growth. And as I continued to meditate, God kept bringing me back to these two scriptures. Something about the lilies, but I couldn't put my finger on it. I just couldn't see where God was leading me. One day, a couple of weeks ago, I'm sitting in the back of the church during service, and I'm praying, and I'm thinking about the lilies and, the, and all that God's trying to tell me, and I get this great idea. And this is one of those ideas that when a person with ADD gets an idea like this, you get out of the way. I was on a mission. I don't think the worship team had their instruments in the cradles, and I was halfway up Dayton Street. <laughs> And my mission was for this. I know the pot's divine. I need to replant it. But I brought this thing home. And I sat it on a table. And I got a cup of coffee. And I sat and I stared at it. Like a blinking contest. But I couldn't see its eyes. I don't know who won. <laughs> but I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, God, what is it about these lilies that you're trying to tell me? And then I realized something. This is not a lily. <laughs> no. What I realized was this plant is stuck in this pot. And until it grows big enough to warrant a new pot or a new place in my home, it will stay right here in this pot. And so there's the aha moment. See, spiritual growth is very much like any growth. And it has a process. It has a beginning stage, like, like a newborn baby. Anybody know what that's like? Anybody remember what it was like to hold a newborn baby? <laughs> I just had to see if you were paying attention. This place is exploding with babies for our visitors that don't know that. Um, but it, it, spiritual growth is like a, a brand new baby. And, and I loved when my children were born. And when they come into this world and they open up their eyes and they start to see everything for the very first time. And everything is, like, fascinating. It's, it's amazing. Uh, lights and sounds and colors and, and jewelry, you know? To a new life beginning to grow, everything around them is wonderful and fascinating. And that's what it was like with our spiritual growth when we first became born again. And everything was just amazing. We opened up that Bible and we read it for the first time, not physically, but as a believer. Because you can read the Bible for years and then become born again and read the Bible for the very first time. Right? But see, watch what happens to the newborn when they get to be about two or three or five. All of a sudden, things aren't quite as fascinating anymore. It takes a little bit more to grab their attention. I hold a flashlight up to my newborn niece over here, and she'll stare at it, amazed. I hold that same flashlight up to my 14-year-old daughter, she's going to look at me like that. It's a flashlight, big whoop. Out of the way. See, spiritual growth is like that. We become born again, and, and wow, Jesus' words, woo! And then after a while, 
time goes by and, and the words are still wonderful and beautiful, but they kind of don't grab us like they used to, you know? The Word was God. The Word was with God. He became flesh, made His dwelling among us, went to the cross. Salvation. Yay! Woo! What about the movie channel tonight? Turn back to that chapter in Luke, page 1031, and look at verse 27 again. Consider how the lilies grow. Stop. Consider how the lilies grow. I don't think Jesus ever asked a question without there being a purpose behind it. Agree? Right? Simon, who do you say that I am? Do you see all these buildings? Do you bring a bowl to put it under a... Do you bring a light to put it under a bowl or a bed? <laughs> Why are you so afraid? Consider the lilies and how they grow. You know, I don't think I've ever heard those scriptures read without them being read in their entirety. The one in Matthew and the one in Luke. And they're beautiful scriptures. They're gorgeous scriptures. They speak about how God cares for us. How he provides for us. He loves us. I've said this before. God loves all creation. We should love creation as much as God loves creation. He loves creation so much. And we say we should. Don't forget to stop and smell the roses. But do we? But you see, by Jesus saying, consider how the lilies grow, what we're hearing is that God stops long enough to look at the flowers. We don't even do that. We say we should, but we don't. Consider how the lilies grow. Jesus said Solomon in all his splendor could not have adorned himself like one of these. Think about this, a flower or a plant in a pot, just doing nothing much more than, than growing, is radiating, shining God's glory, his majesty, simply because it's, it's creation. Take, take a biology class or a chemistry class and, and, and look deep into what's going on in the living world around us. It will boggle your mind. Just the sun's radiation, 92,960,000 miles away, the radiation is coming from the sun, all that distance to provide just enough warmth so as not to harm but to support life and vegetation on Earth. It's amazing. Did you know that the UV rays coming from the sun are actually harmful to plants. So in order to protect themselves, plants create a pigmentation which protects them from the UV light. Now, all the while this is going on, unseen to the naked eye, they're providing colors and smells and oxygen, oxygen. Don't even get me started on anatomy and physiology. Ask my kids. Oxygen comes into our lungs, gets broken down into the bronchioles. The hemoglobin in the bloodstream takes it all the way into the musculoskeletal system where it's transferred into the oxygen where the oxygen is transferred into the muscles to produce energy. I could do it all day long. It's fascinating. But see, what, what I'm saying is this. If God's glory shines through all creation in plants, birds, sun, skies, mountaintops, name it, doesn't it stand to reason that we, in whom God's love has been made manifest, are called to grow and to glorify him through our lives? Anybody ever experienced the uh, proverbial glass ceiling environment? Anybody ever been there? I have. It's an awful thing. You work, you work so hard, strive so hard to, to try to reach something, and you hit that glass ceiling. You want to strive. I mean, you get to that place where you think, well, now what? Because we want to progress. It's, it's na nature. It's natural. We want to move on to bigger and better things. But we get to that place where we feel like we're sort of stuck in a pot, like this plant. And we're trying for all our worth to just grow, but we've reached the limit. Well, see, here's the good news today. God provides everything that we need to continue to grow spiritually. Wherever we are, wherever we find ourselves planted, God provides everything we need to grow. Look, whether we, where we are because God planted us here, or where you, whether you find yourself where you are because you've made some decisions and some choices along the way that have landed you where you are, God meets us where we are. Spiritual growth starts and continues from right where we are in Christ, engrafted into the vine so that we can grow and bear fruit. And so there it is. Spiritual growth is about realizing that I'm not stuck where I am, but I'm called to grow where I am so that I can grow and glorify God. And that starts right here, right today, where we are. So there's Jesus' question. Consider the lilies and how they grow. God never asks a question without there being a reason. I want to try something. I want everybody to take a moment and think about when you became born again. 
when you found Christ. If you just found Christ today, I want you to think about where you were yesterday. If you've been walking with him for a couple of years, 5, 10, 20, think about where you were five years ago. I would hope that we can all safely say we are not today where we were five years ago, right? So it only stands to reason that like a plant growing in a pot or a lily in a field, we should be able to say with at least some certainty that we will not be 10 years from now where we are today, okay? See, that's not to be taken lightly. Paul said, I have been crucified with Christ. Think about this. In the moment we receive Christ, we are immediately and supernaturally transformed from that of a creation with no moral foundation or direction, which lives only for the purpose of self-preservation and self-interest, into that of a newly born again spiritual being made in the image of perfect love, inhabited by the omnipresent, omniscient God. Let me put it in simpler terms. The moment we receive Christ, we go from a mindset of self-centeredness to the spiritual mindset of God-centeredness. Accepting Christ completely changes everything. We're kidding ourselves if we think we can accept Jesus and just go into the next step like nothing's going to change. Without Christ, we have no purpose for living, no reason for faith, and no direction in which to grow. It's a difference between simply existing and living. And God says he wants us to live and to live life to its fullest. So the flowers growing in the field are full of splendor and beauty, glorifying God. How much more are we called to grow and glorify God's love in our lives? Did you think you got saved just to avoid hell? Because if you did, you're missing the whole point. All created things have a time frame, a lifetime, a span. Uh, they're created and they grow and it's over. We were created for eternity, my friends. We were created in his image to love like him, to think like him, to act like him. How often I'll, I'll be in a conversation with someone who knows my dad or my family, and right in conversation somewhere they'll stop and they'll say, wow, Mark, you just look just like your dad right there. See, that's what we're to strive for in our spiritual life. That's what we're to strive for in our spiritual life. We want to grow so that we can reflect God's image. The more we grow in our relationship with the Father, the more we will reflect the Heavenly Father so that when people interact with us, they'll stop us and they'll say, wow, I see Jesus in you right there. And that's a beautiful thing because that's what we want, for people not to see and hear us but to hear Christ and see Christ in us. The Father at work created in his image, growing us to be like him and grafted into the vine. Consider how they grow. Spiritual growth doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen on its own. In Galatians, Paul tells the story of his co conversion on the road to Damascus. And he says that he went to Arabia for three years. Why? To spend time in prayer, to spend time with God, and to grow in his relationship with the Father. A Pharisee amongst Pharisee. If he were here today, Saul would be the quarterback hero. The homecoming king voted most likely to succeed. Yet the day he was faced Christ on the road to Damascus, he was confronted by his own sin before the Father, and he found himself on his knees. Actually, I want to look into that more because I think the correct uh, interpretation is he found himself prostrate on his back. One commentary I read put it ever so eloquently. It explained Paul's emotional and mental state as being violently shaken. Violently shaken. When Paul was faced with his sin, he was violently shaken down to the fiber of his being, to his roots, as it were. I used to always think that it was just the bright lights in, in the presence of God that knocked him off his horse, and it was. But truly, when Paul found himself faced with Christ, he faced his own immortality. What he realized that he was not the growing religious man of God that he thought himself to be, that he was actually not growing at all. If anything, he found out that he was dead in his sin. And that shook him down to his roots. So what did he do? He went to Arabia. Because you see, that's what God does. God meets us where we find where we are. He comes to us on the road. We don't travel to him. We travel seeking him. But he finds us and he meets us. And that's what happened to Paul. And he went to Arabia. Why? He went to Arabia to spend time in the scriptures and to pray. And what happened? He grew. And he grew spiritually. The road to Damascus was Paul's first day of his spiritual growth in Christ. And then in Arabia, he spent time in scriptures and prayer, and he grew. 
And then when he grew, he came back and he found Peter. And together they found fellowship. And they grew some more. And when Paul was ready, then he went out and he fulfilled his mission for the gospel. But Paul never, ever tried to grow faster than God would allow. And he always understood that spiritual growth takes place each and every day right where we find ourselves. Because God meets us where we are. Keep reading, keep praying, and keep showing up. Reading. Let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Romans. So we found out where the first four Gospels are. Now we're going to go Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and Romans. And in your church Bibles, it's going to be page 1121. <coughs> And we're going to read verses, Romans 10, verse 17. Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. You know what? I'm not even going to tell you what to read. Because people do that. People get you saved, then they tell you what you've got to read. Because that's what happened when they got saved, and they, that's what they read, and that's what worked for them. Like there's some sort of a, a baking sheet, cookie-cutter process on how to become born again and grow spiritually. You've got to read the book of John, because all new believers read the book of John. You've got to read a psalm and a proverb every single day. Oy. We could go insane trying to find the right program that everybody wants to give us for how to grow in Christ spiritually. But you see, religion, uh, Christianity is not a program, is it? Christianity isn't a religion, is it? No, it's a relationship. Look, read something from the Word every day. Why? Because faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes from hearing the Word of God. You don't know what to read? Ask Him. Ask Him to show you. God knows our hearts before we even open our mouths anyway. Tell Him you want to grow. Tell Him you want to draw closer to Him. Ask Him to show you. Chances are you come across some book you tucked away in a box in a basement years ago. That's what happened to me. I'm sitting in my office one day, and I'm looking at all my bookshelves. And I was in that place where I kind of needed something new to read, and I was really being drawn by the Spirit to go kind of more. And uh, see, when you do what I do for a living, you tend to collect books and fire trucks. And for those of you who have given me books, I need you to know I love my books. I cherish them, and I keep them all. My son gets my fire trucks. I keep the books. But I'm standing in my office, and I'm like, Lord, I really know that I need to read something. Show me what to read. And I looked down on the shelf, and I, I shared this a couple months ago when I spoke, but I looked down on the shelf, and I came across this. My utmost for his highest, Oswald Chambers, wonderful devotional, highly recommended. But when it was given to me, I was in a place in my spiritual walk, my growth, where I, I remember looking at it going, I just couldn't quite get it. But I put it on the shelf. 1997, that was. 14 years later, 14 years later, I'm standing in my office. Lord, what can I read? And I opened it up. Oh, yeah, I remember this. <gasps> wow. The words, I, could, I followed it. I love it. It's become my favorite daily devotional. 14 years. See, we grow in Christ, and he meets us where we are. Now, if by chance you come across something that you want to read but you're not sure of, see, this is where fellowship comes into play. Because now, you come to church with your book. Dan, I just came across this book, and, and I don't know about the author, I'm not familiar with it. What do you think? Should I read it? You know, what, what do you think, Pastor, or Mom, or whoever? Because I'm going to tell you right now, before we carry on, not everything we read and not everything we hear is going to be good for our spiritual growth. All right? But keep reading, keep praying. God knows where you are. He'll provide for you. He'll show you. He'll grow you. Keep reading, keep praying. Keep doing it together. Book of James, which is now almost to the end of the Bible in its entirety. And in our church Bibles, it's page 1199. And we're going to read chapter 5, verses 13 through 16 in the book of James. 13 through 16, chapter 5. I'm sorry, you know what? That was wrong. We're going to read 13 through 16. Oh, well. Hold them in highest regard and love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers, warn those... Wait, I'm in Thessalonians. That's what the problem is. 
There we go. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Thank you, dear. <laughs> I love my wife. All right, that's good. It kind of broke the uh, tension in here. Good. All right, so 1199, here we go. Prayer of faith. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Brother, where are you? He knows who I'm talking to. I'm not righteous. Yes, you are, because the cross says you're righteous. See, sin held us in bondage. Sin held us in captivity, and it kept us from drawing closer to God. Sin kept us from growing in God. But when Jesus went to the cross, he gave himself and died and rose to break the bondage of sin and to break the bondage of death. And since we know that only a righteous person can stand before God, and since we know that by Jesus' death on the cross, he has risen to break the bondage of sin and death and given us life in Christ, and we are now able to stand before God, and because we stand before God, we are righteous. And since we are righteous, pray. Pray. Pray anything. Pray continuously. Turn to Thessalonians. Page 1171, book of Thessalonians. And I'm not even going to... Verses 15, 16 through 18. Chapter 5, 16 through 18. Rejoice always. Pray continuously Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. What Paul's doing is he's reminding the, Thess the Thessalonians that they must pray and give, keep rejoicing to God in no matter what is happening. Give thanks to God regardless of the circumstances, because no matter what's happening, wherever we find ourselves, God is still God. And we need to be in the continual habit of prayer. See, prayer is not only our way of talking to God. Prayer is God's way of communicating back with us. So we keep praying. It's so, so important to be praying regularly. It's an awesome privilege that we are given to be able to pray, to boldly go directly to the throne of God and interact personally with our Creator, the very one who literally spoke us into existence and then supernaturally transforms us to become united with Him in one spirit, to be one with God. Wow! Pray continually. And what Paul's really saying is to just be in a habit of prayer. A couple weeks ago, I, we had a uh, theater and film team here, rehearsal, and I'm heading back home, and I was driving down the road, and I looked up, and I saw the moon. And it's that time of year where you get, I think they call it the harvest moon. I mean, it was like, wow, just sitting there. And that still just blows me away when I consider the moon, this big sphere of matter just sitting there suspended in space and the earth and the sun. And everything is just held perfectly in orbit. But I looked up at that moon and I had to stop as I'm, well, I didn't stop, I was driving, but, and I kept my eyes open. But we can pray when we drive. But I looked up at that moon and I'm thinking, Lord, that's just awesome. And I had to say, God, thank you. Thank you for showing me that tonight because I'm now re for reminding me of, of your power, your glory, your, your, your majesty, for your love. Thank you, God, for showing me this tonight. Thank you, Lord. And then I got home, and to be honest with you, I couldn't even tell you what we did the rest of the night. And I don't remember what we did at theater team that night, but I do remember looking up at that moon and talking to God. Keep praying, keep reading, keep showing up. Third point is fellowship. Because we were created for relationships, we were created for fellowship, and God unites us through the Holy Spirit living within us. So we are united together in spirit, and so like the flowers in the field, he's asking us to grow together. And in Jesus, we've been given the promise that we are loved, and that we are provided for, and that we're not left to grow alone. Can you imagine what would have happened if Jesus called all the disciples together for like the first time? and he brought them out into the wilderness for, say, a, a weekend retreat. 
And he brought them all out there, and he performed a few miracles and <laughs> convinced them he was the son of God. And then after a couple of days, he brought them all back and said, congratulations, you've all passed the weekend program. Here's your certificates. Go make disciples. And he left them. You know what would have happened? I'll tell you what would have happened. The same thing that happens to anybody who depends solely on retreats and conferences for their spiritual growth. They would have come back all full of fire and fury and went out, and as soon as they faced any kind of persecution, they would have fell right back into their old ways of thinking, scared to death and wondering what they were believing. Now, not to say that retreats and conferences are not good. They're great. And I need to take a moment to plug the men's retreat that we go to every year in October. And I, I hope that every man in here will take a moment to uh, talk to somebody about the retreat because it's just a great weekend. But you see, we don't grow completely spiritually over a weekend. It's, it's, it's not a weekend program. It's a 24-7, 365-day process to grow spiritually. All right? We don't leave on Friday and come back on Monday ready to change the world. We think we do, and we feel like we do. And this is why retreats and pro uh, conferences are great. You see, they give us a glimpse of the mountaintop. And we need to get a glimpse of the mountaintop, the, a glimpse of the mountaintop sometimes. But the, a characteristic of spiritual growth is being able to maintain a mountaintop perspective when we find ourselves walking back through the valley again. And it is next to impossible to hold on to that perspective when you're trying to traverse the valley roads alone. Brothers, the worst thing that can happen to any believer is to find themselves filled up with God and left alone by his people. If a believer is going to have any kind of healthy spiritual growth or continue to grow in the Lord, they're going to need good soil to grow in. Nutrients comprised of God's word, God's prayer, and fellowship of other believers. Hebrews, after the book of James, on page 1191, Hebrews 10, 23, and 25. <clears throat> Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not giving up, give up meeting together, as some are in habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more as we see the day approaching. Because the day is approaching, and we are growing together in the Lord to glorify him, to share his beauty, to show his love to the world around us, because he's the coming back, and he wants us to be ready, and he wants us to bring people to him, and he wants us to grow further to, along with him. I've heard this called intentionality. It's, it's, it's a word that I came across recently. I, I seem to be hearing it a lot, but it's intentionality. The disciples chose to stay together. They chose to stay close to Jesus. They could have walked away at any time, and many of them did. There were a whole lot of disciples, and a lot of them fell away. But those that heard the call, those that were chosen, those that chose to stay, stayed together, and they drew closer to each other. They stayed close to Jesus, and they grew together and they grew in wisdom, and they grew in faith, and they grew in spiritual spirit, and they grew in the Lord. God has provided the lilies of the field, everything that they need to just grow and glorify him and show his majesty. He will also and has also provided everything that we need to continue to grow in a way that we will glorify and show his love and his majesty to all the beauty around us. Keep reading, keep praying, keep showing up. I'm going to dismiss everyone, and I'm not going to ask the worship team to come up today. But what I would like to do is just ask you to take advantage of this opportunity to maybe maintain, stay in your seats in the sanctuary. It'll stay quiet, and you can read. Or if you'd like, you can maybe come up, and, and the prayer team will make themselves available. Or you can stay in your seat and pray, and nobody will bother you. Um, or if you'd like, you may head out to the lobby and, and maybe take some time in fellowship. Um, but we are here together to grow and to share our love for one another and to shine God's glory. Thank you for, for hearing my words today. You are dismissed. <clears throat>